வணக்கம் பிஃபோர் டீலிங் வித் மேனேஜ்மெண்ட் ஆஃப் ஃப்ராக்சர்ஸ் இட் இஸ் ஓன்லி லாஜிக்கல் தட் வி அண்டர்ஸ்டாண்ட் அண்ட் லேர்ன் அபவுட் தி அனாட்டமி ஆஃப் த போன் அண்ட் தி பயோ மெக்கானிக்ஸ் ஆஸ் ஃபார் அஸ் தி அனாட்டமி இஸ் கன்சர்ன் வி மே பி குவைட் கான்ஃபிடென்ட் பட் தேர் ஆர் சர்டன் பாயிண்ட்ஸ் இன் தி அனாட்டமி தட் மே பி வெரி குரூஷியல் when we are dealing with the fractures and we shall learn those points too but understanding the biomechanics of the bone is a different ball game altogether it sounds very technical and complicated stress strain load yield point and what not too much of physics it looks like but it can be understood quite easily if we try to learn it in a very simple manner and that's what we are planning to do in this video So we now start our series on management of fractures in the hand with the understanding of the anatomy and biomechanics in the module called basics. When we compare the hand bones that is the metacarpals and phalanges to the other long bones of the body we find that though they are small they bear as much loads in younger patients sporting injuries are more common in the middle age work related injuries are commonly seen and in the elderly patients falls are the commonest cause of injuries of the hand bones other injuries like punching a wall or solid object and high energy injuries like road traffic accidents can also cause fractures of the metacarpals and phalanges understanding these fractures before managing them is very important and looking at the pattern of injuries we find that understanding the basics of fractures of metacarpals and phalanges would mean that we need to understand the biomechanics of bone and to do this we need to understand the gross anatomy of the bone and the properties of the bone let us try to understand this gross anatomy under the headings of parts of the bone types of bone tissues that are present the composition of the bone and the cells that are present within the bone the long bone consists of mainly three parts the diaphysis the metaphysis and the epiphysis the diaphysis is the tubular shaft which is hollow and called the medullary cavity and filled with yellow marrow the epiphysis is present at each end of the bone filled with spongy bone with red marrow in the spaces between the metaphysis is between the epiphysis and the diaphysis contains the epiphyseal growth plate and in adulthood this cartilage is replaced by bone the bone has two important coverings the periosteum and the endosteum the periosteum which covers the entire outer surface of the bone except at the articulations with other bones where the articular cartilage covers the bone the periosteum consists of two layers an outer fibrous layer and an inner cellular layer the outer fibrous layer actually consists of a superficial portion which is inelastic contains less number of cells and mainly has a collagenous matrix and very few elastic fibers it is highly vascularized the deeper portion of the outer layer is a fibroelastic layer consisting mainly of elastic fibers the inner layer of the periosteum otherwise called the cambium layer is highly cellular and consists of many types of cells like the mesenchymal progenitor cells differentiated osteogenic progenitor cells osteoblasts and fibroblasts in a little collagenous matrix thick bundles of collagen fibers called the sharpies fibers anchor the periosteum to the cortical bone underneath endosteum lines the medullary cavity where bone growth repair and remodeling occur it is thinner than the periosteum and consists mainly of flattened osteoprogenitor cells and type 3 collagenous fibers there are three types of endosteum based on their location the cortical endosteum lines the marrow cavity osteon endosteum lines the osteons and the trabecular endosteum lines the trabeculae when there is a fracture the role of the periosteum and endosteum are paramount following the fracture and the breach in the periosteum clots form around the bone fragments osteoblasts multiply within 2 days and the cambium expands and starts forming the callus 
osteoblastic differentiation then occurs which causes bone growth. The endosteum also reacts to the fracture with the hematoma leading to rapid multiplication of endosteal cells aiding in osteal solidification. This helps in building a bridge of a reparatory callus. Having seen the different parts of the gross anatomy of the bones, we shall now see the types of bone tissue that are seen. There are two basic types of bone tissue. Compact bone, otherwise known as cortical bone and spongy bone, otherwise known as cancellous bone. The adult human skeleton contains about 80% of cortical bone and 20% of spongy bone. They are present in different ratios in different bones. For example, the ratio of cortical bone to spongy bone is 25 is to 75 in vertebra, 50 is to 50 in the femoral head and 95 is to 5 in the radial diaphysis. Compact bone is the denser and stronger of the two types of bone tissue. It is found in the diaphysis of long bones where it provides support and protection. The basic microscopic structural unit of the compact bone is called the cortical osteon or the haversian system. Each cortical osteon consists of concentric rings of calcified matrix called lamellae. In the center of each osteon is a central canal known as the haversian canal. It contains blood vessels, nerves and lymphatics. The central canal has branches called Folkman's canals through which the blood vessels can reach the periosteum and the endosteum. The osteocytes are located in spaces called lacunae at the borders of the adjacent lamellae. There is an intricate network by which the canaliculae connect with the canaliculae of other lacunae and eventually with the central canal of each haversian system. There are an estimated 21 into 10 to the power of 6 cortical osteons in healthy human adults. So the total haversian remodeling area comes to around 3.5 square meters. The ultrastructure of the spongy bone is slightly different. The lacunae and osteocytes are found in a lattice-like network of matrix called trabeculae. That is the reason why spongy bone is sometimes called trabecular bone. These trabecular osteons are called packets and there are around 14 into 10 to the power of 6 trabecular osteons in healthy human adults with a total trabecular area of approximately 7 square meters. These trabeculae are what give the spongy bone its characteristic appearance. Now let us compare the features of cortical bone and cancellous bone. Cortical bone has a porosity of 5% to 15% while cancellous bone is 40 to 95% porous. Cortical bone is found in the diaphysis of long bones and also as a thin layer around the trabecular bone. Cancellous bone is found mainly in the metaphysis and epiphysis. The cortical bone being dense can withstand compressive forces. Cancellous bone on the other hand has open spaces and supports shifts in weight distribution. So we are able to understand now about cortical bone and cancellous bone. But what is this bone actually composed of? It is composed of cells in an extracellular matrix and this extracellular matrix is composed of organic and inorganic substances in water. That is 50 to 70 percent is mineral, 20 to 40 percent is organic, 5 to 10 percent is water and less than 3 percent consists of lipids. The mineral content or inorganic content consists of calcium phosphate and calcium carbonate which combine to create hydroxyapatite. This is the main component of the inorganic substances in the bone. Other inorganic salts like magnesium hydroxide, fluoride and sulphate are further incorporated into this. All these inorganic substances that we have seen crystallize or calcify on the collagen fibers. Among the organic components of bone, type 1 collagen comprises 90%. Proteoglycans, proteins, growth factors and cytokines comprise the other 10%. Finally, we come to the most important part of the bone, the living tissue or the cells. 
four types of cells are found within bone tissue the osteogenic cell the osteoblast the osteocyte and the osteoclast the osteogenic cells are undifferentiated and develop into osteoblasts the osteoblast continually forms new bone when osteoblasts get trapped within the calcified matrix their structure and function changes and they become osteocytes osteoclasts develop from monocytes and macrophages and differ in appearance from other bone cells let us try to understand more about these cells by comparing them the osteogenic cells develop into osteoblasts and they are located in the deep layer of the periosteum osteoblasts have the important function of bone formation and they are located in all growing portions of the bone including the periosteum and the endosteum osteocytes maintain mineral concentration of the matrix and they are found in spaces called lacunae entrapped in the matrix osteoclasts are important for bone resorption and they are found on bone surfaces and old unused bone in trying to understand the biomechanics of the bone we have now begun to understand the anatomy next we need to understand the properties of the bone structure as such these are influenced by the material from which the structure is composed that is the mechanical properties of the bone and the distribution of this material that is the geometric properties based on the form of the bone bone material properties are the tissue level mechanical properties that describe the constituent material and are independent of the size and shape of the bone these properties contribute to the strength of the bone this bone strength is a measure of the resistance of the bone to any force of deformation and the structural strength is the force required to cause the whole bone to fail or fracture supposing a load of x is applied to a bone nothing apparent happens to the bone but when a load of x dash is given the bone fractures so x dash is the structural strength of the bone so when there is any force or load on a bone the bone reacts in two ways first it offers resistance to the force this is called stress secondly it undergoes a very minimal change in length due to the force and this is called strain so stress is defined as the force applied to an object divided by the area a over which the force is applied stress is symbolized by sigma and the formula is force by area that is newtons per square meters the unit of stress is pascals 1 newton per square meter is 1 pascal this stress is mainly caused by compression forces the elongation that results from the force that is applied is expressed as strain or the change in length of the material normalized to its initial length that is the changed length minus the original length divided by the original length strain is symbolized by epsilon and measured in millimeters or percentage this apparent lengthening of the bone though it is very minimal occurs because of the collagen fibers that are present within the bone the stress and strain on any bone will depend on its thickness and length the larger bone will have lower stress than a smaller bone for the same force that is applied this is because stress is more about a compression force on the other hand a longer bone will have a lower strain than the shorter bone for the same force because strain is about tensile strength that is trying to lengthen the bone this is the typical stress strain curve when a force is applied to a bone first the bone resists and also minimally lengthens in a response to the force this is the linear part of the curve and this represents the elastic modulus or the young's modulus 
Young's modulus represents a general stiffness of the material. Stiffer materials, that is brittle materials, have a higher Young's modulus. The material's yield stress occurs at the end of the linear region, which is typically the point where irreversible damage begins occurring. The yield stress of a material indicates that the material is beginning to fail or break. The ultimate or failure stress represents the stress at which the material ruptures or fractures. The end of the curve, that is, at the point where the stress abruptly drops to zero, represents the material's failure stress or strength and it occurs when the specimen breaks. Finally, the area under the curve, that is the shaded area now, represents the amount of energy expended in breaking the specimen. This is also known as the material toughness. The Young's modulus is different for different types of bones. Cortical bone has a Young's modulus of 17 to 27 gigapascals, while cancellous bone has a Young's modulus of 2 to 20 gigapascals. The Young's modulus for steel is 200 gigapascals and for titanium, is 115 gigapascals. We have seen the general properties of the bone, but the geometric forms of the bones are different and these two play an important role in the strength of the bone. The first thing we need to know is that bone is anisotropic, that is, its young modulus is dependent upon the direction of the loading or the force. This means that the strength of the bone will be different in different directions of application of the force. This force can be of four basic types when it affects the bone. Compression force, tension force, shear force and torsion. When we consider cortical bone alone, they can withstand compression up to 212 newtons per square meter. They can withstand tension up to 146 newtons per square meter and they can withstand shear only up to 82 newtons per square meter. So bone is weakest in shear, then tension, then compression. Another important characteristic of the bone that can modify its strength is the geometric form. Let us consider three shapes of the bone. Sample A is cylindrical but solid. Sample B is also cylindrical but it is hollow and has a thin cortex. Sample C is cylindrical, hollow and has a thick cortex. The surface area of both sample A and B are same, but the surface area of sample C is double. If we consider the tensile and compressive strength of sample A and B to be similar, that is 100%, the tensile and compressive strength of the model C is doubled, it becomes 200%. But when we consider the bending and torsional strength of these models, if it is considered 100% in shape A, it is 210% in shape B and 459% in shape C. So this shows the importance of the shape of the bone in determining its strength. So far, in our attempt at understanding the biomechanics of bone, we have begun understanding the anatomy and we have begun understanding the properties of bone. But we still need to understand the actual anatomy of the hand bones, that is the metacarpals and phalanges, before we try to start understanding the fracture management. And this we shall consider in the next video. I hope you enjoyed this video. I enjoyed making it. Please click on the shown links to see more videos put up in this channel. And do not forget to subscribe to stay connected with the latest in learning hand surgery. Vanakkam.